Welcome back to the Research Lab X Research Primer Series. I'm Dr. Oscar Wong, and in the next two videos, we'll be talking about meta-analysis and systematic review. To give you an overview of what this video entails, we'll be first going through what a systematic review and meta-analysis is. Next, we will take you through the steps in conducting them, which include research question formulation, development of a search strategy, study selection, data collection and quality assessment. Finally, we'll go through the common challenges that need to be addressed when conducting them, namely publication bias and heterogeneity. So before going through how to do a meta-analysis, I think it's really important for us to first understand what is meta-analysis. So it's a statistical technique that involves systematically analyzing and synthesizing data for multiple studies to draw conclusion about the overall effect of a treatment or intervention. This method provides a more precise estimate of treatment effect than individual studies and allows for the identification of whether there is a significant treatment effect, and if so, if it's positive or negative. By combining data from multiple studies, meta-analysis can provide statistically stronger conclusion about the effectiveness of a treatment or intervention. Therefore, it represents the highest level of evidence and represents the top of the hierarchy of evidence, as mentioned in the previous videos. So to answer the question, when is meta-analysis appropriate? So we usually conduct them when there are sufficient data available to pull and analyze. So ideally, the study should have homogeneous outcome and also homogeneous reporting of those outcomes. And there should be more than one study included. And we usually don't include case reports, uh, case series or review article. Let's say a group of researchers want to discuss about, you know, effectiveness of a specific medication for treating portal hypertension in patients with liver cirrhosis. Upon searching the medical literature, they found five studies for these purposes. Upon reviewing these studies, they note that the outcome measures are drastically different. For example, one study measured portal hypertension reduction at six months, or another study only reported proportion of patients with resolution of clinically significant portal hypertension. So the outcomes are too different to be combined, um, and therefore we can't draw any meaningful conclusion from, from those studies. So additionally, meta-analysis may be necessary when there is conflicting evidence in the field and previous meta-analysis have not been able to resolve those conflicts. So in cases where a previous meta-analysis has been conducted, it is important to carefully evaluate the quality of the analysis and the conclusion drawn. If the previous meta-analysis has limitations, flaws, or if it is outdated, a new meta-analysis might be necessary to provide more accurate and reliable conclusion. Sometimes, an updated meta-analysis may also be warranted if a new landmark study has just been published. As with all things, a good research project starts with a good plan and the first part of the plan will be generating the research question. First, we can look backwards. This involves conducting a comprehensive literature review to understand what has been done. In particular, you can pay attention to the limitations section in the discussion of landmark papers to identify gaps that can be filled. For example, were specific subgroups not considered in previous studies? This can include certain age groups not being analyzed or analysis not being stratified by different disease severities. Identify those gaps is a good way to start thinking about the research question. Sometimes when there are new statistical methods available, you can also think about reanalyzing past data. For example, new meta-analysis methods such as individual patient data meta-analysis allow you to reanalyze previous data and derive more accurate results. And previously, such studies have been published in major journals including Lancet or JAMA. Secondly, when, you when designing the research question, you can also look forward. So this involves identifying what topic is in trend right now. Major journals often publish editorials or special edition 
which can be useful for you to identify the topics of interest to the wider field at the moment. Look, looking forward also entails building on the findings of previous study. This can be as simple as validation study where you test and independently verify the finding of a previous landmark study. You can also try to expand the previous study to patient populations that were previously not considered, such as a different disease severity, etc. Considering those points could be useful in identifying a worthwhile research project that could be of interest to the scientific community, which will subsequently have greater publishing value. Okay, so once you have decided the research question, you can consider writing it down in the PICO format, which is a helpful framework for medical and healthcare related research. To recap what we went through in the very first video of the series, PICO stands for Patients, Intervention, Comparisons and Outcomes. You can also write down the research question in a single sentence like above. The PICO framework helps breaking down the research question into its core component and it further helps with planning including what study design to use, what data to collect, and what statistical analysis to use. Next, we will go through in further detail how to use PICO in the context of systematic review and meta-analysis with more concrete examples. Okay, so breaking down the research question into each component of PICO helps you with refining the question. You can continue to add on additional details for each component, which will help with writing the research protocol. A narrower scope may allow for a more clinically focused manuscript, decrease, decreasing heterogeneity, and result in less studies to sift through, saving you a lot of time. Here are some details you can consider for the patient component of PICO. Firstly, is there an official definition for the disease or condition? For example, the American Diabetes Association, World Health Organization, and International Diabetes Federation each has their own definition of diabetes. Similarly, alcohol liver disease versus alcohol hepatitis and acute on chronic liver failure due to alcoholism and compose extremely different patient cohorts. Secondly, are these varying severity for the condition? For instance, NAFLD is a broad term defined by excessive fat accumulation is often a diagnosis of exclusion compared to NASH, which is a histo histological diagnosis requiring biopsy to show inflammation, ballooning, and various degree of fibrosis. fibrosis. Similarly, hepatocellular carcinoma can be staged according to the Barcelona Cl Clinic Liver Cancer Criteria, and studies may focus on either early versus advanced HCC. All these will be important to consider for the inclusion criteria for the study as outcome will vary by the disease definition and severity. You can also think about conducting stratified analysis by different definition or severity, which you could yield interesting results. Next, you should start looking into demographic details, things like age, sex, or ethnicity. Do these factors affect the outcome of interest? and would you consider limiting the enrollment in your study? For example, your meta-analysis can be looking at pediatric study or adult study and exclude one group or another. In some meta-analysis, rather than limiting enrollment, authors may also consider statistical methods such as subgroup analysis or meta-regression to study the effect of various baseline demographics such as sex or NACT as mentioned. This will be explain in greater details in the next video. Finally, you can also consider the setting of the study. This is to allow you to plan for subgroup analysis that you might want to conduct further down the road. For example, some studies are based on hospital patients, while some studies collected their data from community-based health checkups. Studies may be also conducted in different countries, which may allow for subgroup analysis by geographical regions this will have logistical implication on how detailed you extract the data from the various included study. Considering those points that I've mentioned, it's important in refining your research question and guiding what analysis that you should use with the data at hand. Similarly, 
We, we should also define our intervention and control category well to ensure that the findings are accurate and importantly, those interventions are standardized. Th and those things include dosage of medication or even route of administration, differences in surgical approach such as open versus laparoscopy, or even duration of treatment and etc. So when drafting the PICO for your research question and study protocol, you should consider any factor that could lead to different outcome. And those should be recorded down so the subgroup analysis can be conducted based on whatever you have noticed and the intervention can be standardized. Finally, on to the outcome session of the PICO. First, you should consider what the outcome of interest in your systematic review and meta-analysis are. Besides consulting senior authors, you can read a few related studies to have a sense of what outcomes are usually of interest and if they are appear across multiple studies, as you, you will want to extract outcomes with more than three studies in order to pull the data. Next, consider how the various outcomes are defined by the individual study. For example, in this example uh, shown, study A to E, they define CVD events as a QMI, heart failure, stroke, aortic stenosis as an IHE respectively. So the outcome of interest can be defined as you know, CVD events as an umbrella term, allowing all five articles to be included, or further categorized into ischemic versus non-ischemic CVD events. Alternatively, some may choose to limit the outcome of interest to three-point major advanced cardiovascular disease, MACE, which will result in the exclusion of study B, D, and E. The de definition across study affect your decision on whether it is appropriate to pull the outcomes. A lot of times, individual studies included in meta-analysis can have quite varied outcome definition. However, it is still possible to pull the data and interpret the conclusion in the context of the heterogeneity. In these cases, subgroup analysis and other statistical methods to explain the heterogeneity should be conducted to supplement the main analysis. Importantly, definition of the outcome is a key information that will have to be collected as it ensures the comparison can be made between your data and the information that has already been published. The relevant definitions of the outcome should be emphasized in the study protocol. It may also be useful to consider if there are any existing guidelines or landmark study that you can reference so that there is an objective measure of those outcomes. For example, three-point major advanced cardiovascular event as defined by the FDA and EMA include acute myocardial infarction, stroke and cardiovascular mortality which has, which has last, largely been adopted in clinical trials that evaluate the cardiovascular safety of diabetic agent. In reality, substantial study may have ambiguous or missing definition. It is up to the author's discretion to assess the suitability of including these studies and conduct a quality assessment accordingly. Nevertheless, it is key to ensure transparent reporting so the readers can have a holistic and unbiased understanding of those limitations and the quality of the data to make sound conclusion. Fuck off, so it's also important to organize our outcomes into specific categories to ensure a neat and logical flow of thought. For instance, many manuscripts group their outcome into primary and secondary outcomes. Other possible ways of organizing your outcome could be by pre-op, intra-op and post-op short and versus long-term outcome, or even positive and negative effects of the intervention. This decision is dependent on the narrative you want to craft and the outcomes should be organized in an intuitive, easy-to-follow manner, which provides clinically relevant information. Additionally, there are also time-to-event, categorical and continuous outcomes, so the numerical nature of the data will affect the statistical method employed to pull the data to calculate the summary estimates, which we will dive into in the next video. Okay, so, so far we have gone through PICO really, really thoroughly. And here are the four key points I want you guys to remember when formulating your research questions and planning your subsequent data collection and analysis. Firstly, 
it's important to be clear of all the definitions involved. This is as simple as the popu patient population or condition you are studying, all the way to how the outcome of interest is defined. If the definitions are unclear, it could result in a lower quality study and will also attract criticism from reviewers. To avoid this, you should read out on the latest key studies and guidelines to make sure it's in line with the widely accepted definition. Secondly, you should identify possible different subgroup which can partially affect the result before starting the study. Things like age, sex, ethnicity, or also or any other way to define different subgroups in the intervention. These are all important co-founders that could be addressed in the analysis, so you should try to collect as much data on this as possible. Thirdly, in prevalence meta-analysis, it is not necessary to fill in all components for the PICO. For example, if the study is on the incidence of HCC recurrence in liver transplant recipient, it will only require to fill in the patient and outcome components. Finally, Always check for similar study and register your systematic review and meta-analysis in the Prospero website where possible. While it is not compulsory, this is good research practice and prevents duplication of your work. Okay, so as mentioned, over here you can see the Prospero webpage. The application takes around 30 minutes to fill out, but the processing can take between 1 to 3 months before it's officially accepted. And once it is accepted, you can include the protocol ID in your manuscript. With this, we have come to the end of the first part of the video, or research question formulation. Next, we'll be moving on to search strategies. Okay, so now we'll start talking about how to develop an effective search strategy. So how do we find and download all the articles that fit our PICO criteria so that we can see if and choose the relevant articles for our systematic review? So this is where we use this thing called search strategy. So in a nutshell, search strategy involves selecting appropriate databases, using specific search terms and operators, applying filters, and refining the search to retrieve the most relevant articles. The goal, the goal of a search strategy is to ensure comprehensive and targeted retrieval of re literature while minimizing the inclusion of in irrelevant or non-applicable study. A well-designed search strategy forms the foundation for conducting any systematic review, while a poorly designed search strategy is guaranteed to give you a big headache. Ima imagine the pain of having to receive thousands of articles. So to, to prevent you to having problems in your search strategy, we will now go through the eight essential components of a good search strategy. First, start with your research question of PICO framework. Each element of PICO helps you identify relevant search terms and concepts. Second, identify keywords and synonyms that describe your research question. Also, consider using controlled vocabulary, vocabulary like MASH terms specific to the database you are using. Third, third, use Boolean operators, things like AND, OR, or NOT, to combine and refine your search terms or to narrow your search. Fourth, use appropriate database that can match your research topic. Popular options include Medline, Embase, Scopus, Word of Science, and etc. We suggest using Medline over PubMed as it has a broader scope of which PubMed is a subset. Fifth, ap apply filters or limit to focus your search. For example, you can target specific study designs, publication dates, languages or other relevant criteria but be careful not to exclude potentially important study by being too restrictive six always remember to hand search the reference list of relevant articles to find additional source also known as snowballing strategy seven refine and modify your search strategy based on initial search results evaluate the relevance of retrieved articles and adjust your search terms if needed to improve precision and sensitivity. Lastly, document everything, document and report your search strategy comprehensively. Include the databases search, search term use, or any filter or limits apply. So this will ensure transparency so people can assess the validity and comprehensiveness of your search.
So by following this principle, you can create a well-designed search strategy to retrieve relevant articles for your literature review. So we'll now go through an example of how to develop a search strategy from scratch. As shown here, the research question of interest is the outcome of abstinence in patients with alcohol cirrhosis. So first we define the question using the PICO framework as shown. Next, the search strategy can be constructed using a simple table such as the one shown here. For, for each element of PICO, generate the MASH term followed by the keywords and synonyms. So what exactly is MASH? MASH stands for Medical Subject Heading, which is basically a standardized topic header under which all related articles are catalogued manually by the database manager. For example, an article that reveals quality of life of ex-drinkers with alcoholic cirrhosis and an article that examines treatments for alcohol addiction will both be catalogued under the medical subject heading abstinence. Medical subject headings can usually be found within the database of interest, which we will go through later. Secondly, synonyms are often needed to supplement MESH because the cataloging of articles under MESH is done manually, result resulting in some articles not being correctly catalogued. Thus, the use of synonyms ensure that all relevant articles are captured. To generate these keywords, it is helpful to have conducted literature review beforehand to note down the various synonyms in different articles. In the previous slide, the pickle was specific to outcomes of abstinent patients with alcoholic cirrhosis. You may therefore consider including such terms such as outcomes or mortality and etc. However, this will narrow down the search further and may be too restrictive, resulting in certain articles of interest being missed out. Thus, the outcomes portion is optional for this specific research question. Importantly, refining the search strategy is of often an iterative process based on trial and error. Let us now dive into the syntax of MBase, the database of interest. Over here, the MESH term as highlighted in green has the syntax slash exp, which simply stands for explosion. This basically expands the search tree and includes the relevant article under this label. Secondly, the syn synonyms as highlighted in yellow ensure that all relevant articles are captured. Importantly, the use of proximity filters such as near slash to is a tool that you can utilize to join phrases, as well as adjust the number of results that your search strategy ultimately yields. Near slash to indicates that the words in brackets have to be within two words of each other regardless of order. If this is too restrictive, you can play around and change it to near slash three where appropriate. This is in, contra in contrast to the use of next slash two, which indicates the words have to be within two words of each other in a specific order. So as we can see as well, the use of TIAB at the end of each synonym as highlighted in pink is to search for the specific word in the title and abstract. Moving on, the Boolean operators, as shown in red, are often used to combine different parts of the search strategy. As mentioned previously, A and D N narrows the search, while O R or broadens the search. In the example here, OR is used to include articles either catalogued under the subject header abstinence or contain any valid related phrases such as former drinker, etc. Comparatively, and is used to narrow down the article to those related to abstinence specific to patients with alcoholic cirrhosis or alcoholic liver disease as defined by the PICO framework. Thus, an irrelevant article that mentions abstinence but fails to mention anything related to alcoholic cirrhosis will more likely to be excluded. Other filters such as those restricted to English language as highlighted in orange are not always necessary but can be included when you want to further reduce the number of the articles retrieved. Finally, truncation, which is denoted by the asterisk as shown in blue, is used to capture articles with similar words but different spelling or grammar. Most importantly, an effect effective search strategy must be able to capture key articles which you have previously identified to be crucial to your PICO. Now we'll briefly go through how to navigate the Embase interface. Go to the advanced tab to begin entering your search strategy. We strongly recommend constructing the search strategy in a Word document before keying in the terms. Over here, 
you also notice a mapping tab that is automatically selected. This allows for the database to automatically map your input to a related subject heading or match term where available. Alternatively, you can also use M3 to find mesh terms for your PICO. Here's a, list of, here's a list of mesh terms pops out when I enter abstinence, so I simply have to select the one relevant to my PICO. So as you can see, I've selected alcohol abstinence. As mentioned previously, exp slash explodes all the terms in the tree as seen on the left hand side of the screen. On the right hand side, M3 also provides some synonym at the bottom right corner which you can use to develop your search strategy. Moving on, we'll now look at Medline, another database that we will be conducting our search in. Thus, this search strategy developed using the same PICO has the exact same elements as the M-based example. The main difference, however, lies in the syntax. For example, match terms in Medline, highlighted in green, simply end with a slash rather than exp slash, as seen previously. Additionally, the proximity filters highlighted in purple use ADJ rather than next. Finally, the punctuation in the in TIAB highlighted in pink is also different from MBase. Let's have a quick recap of what we just went through. The following two slides show a summary of the search syntax tips for the two most commonly used database, MBase and Medline respectively. These include proximity filters, adding TIAP to search for specific words within the title and abstract. And on the, on the next slide, we can also see the use of asterisk as a truncation for different spelling of the same word, boolean operators to combine sets as well as mesh terms. After you have developed your search on the relevant database, do not forget components 6, 7 and 8 of all effective search strategies. This including hand searching reference lists, conducting a quick Google search to ensure all key articles are included, and finally documenting the final search result as seen above which would need to be reported in the final manuscript. Additionally, Additionally, if this is your first time, consider seeking the assistance of a professional librarian for the search strategy to prevent missing out on important studies. Okay, so there you have it. You have finalized your search strategy and now is the time to download your result. So what you can do is you can download the result of your search strategy and import them into your saving software of choice, such as EndNote or Rayon. This video shows how you can download the files and open them in EndNote. So this brings us to the end of our section on search strategy. Remember, practice makes perfect, and there's no better way to learn than crafting your own search strategy from scratch. All right, quick recap. So initially, we examined the formulation of research question using the PICO framework. We then covered the eight essential components of a well-designed search strategy. Now we'll go through the stud study selection process. Study selection involves two main steps the title abstract saving, and the full text reviewing. First, the title abstract saving helps to identify studies that might meet the inclusion criteria. As search results are often important for multiple databases, there can often be duplicates or overlapping studies. So before starting the save, it's imperative to remove those du duplicates. While software programs such as EndNote have tools to identify and remove duplicates, these tools are imperfect and there will often still be duplicate study that will need to be manually removed subsequently. Importantly, document the number of duplicates identified, which later you will have to report it in your manuscript. During the initial screening, it's also important to be over-inclusive and include study that might potentially meet the inclusion criteria. This is done to minimize the risk of excluding relevant study. The article that passed the initial screening are then subjected to a full text review. The reviewer should thoroughly read the entire article to assess the eligibility for inclusion in the meta-analysis. At this stage, reviewers will have to make the final de decision on whether an article should be included in the analysis based on its relevance, methodology, and other predefined criteria. For instance, studies should be only included if they have at least one outcome of interest. Other consideration includes limiting the language of publication to English articles only and the decision on whether to include conference abstracts. Often abstracts are excluded as they are not peer-reviewed data and study quality cannot be assessed. To ensure impartiality and minimizing bias, full text review is often conducted by two reviewers independently. 
they work separately without knowing each other's decision. And if there are any disagreement between the reviewers regarding the inclusion, they attempt to resolve conflict through discussion and consensus. If, ne if necessary, a senior author or expert might be consulted for guidance. Several software tools can assist in managing the study selection process. EndNote, Ryan, Excel, or Google Sheet are examples of software commonly used in meta-analysis. This tool can help organizing and tracking the articles, facilitating collaboration between reviewers, and streamlining the whole selection process. So in a meta-analysis, researchers often distinguish between randomized and non-randomized studies. Randomized control trials are considered the gold standard for evaluating intervention as they evolve random assignments of participants to different treatment groups. On the other hand, non-randomized studies such as observational study can provide valuable insights but are subject to potential biases. Today, we'll briefly go through cross-sectional study versus prospective and retrospective cohort study as well as case control studies. So in cross-sectional studies, Data is collected at a single point in time, providing a snapshot of a population and can help identifying associations between variables. However, they do not establish causality or the temporal sequence of events. Comparatively, in prospective cohorts, a group of individuals is identified based on a specific characteristic or exposure and being followed over a period of time to observe the occurrence of outcome or events of interest. This study design allows researchers to examine the relationship between exposures and outcome and assess potential cause and effect relationship. In a retrospective cause study, the researchers will have to look back in time to identify a group of individuals who were exposed to a particular factor or condition and compare them to another group of individuals who were not exposed. The data are often collected from existing records this study design is extremely common as it is often uh, unfeasible to conduct a prospective study due to time or resources constraint. Last but not least, in case control studies, individuals with the outcome of interest are compared to individuals without the outcome as control group to examine the exposure history of both groups. However, case control studies are often excluded from meta-analysis as they are prone to recall bias and tend to vary widely in designing, resulting in heterogeneity. So as you can see on the slide, identifying multiple reports is one of the most important thing in meta-analysis. So in meta-analysis, the unit of interest is typically the individual study rather than the individual report. If multiple reports originate from the same study, they are often treated as a single study to avoid duplication of data. Overlapping reports from the same study may arise on different publication outlets or multiple publications addressing different aspects of the same study. So these overlapping reports have to be identified and considered as part of the study's selection process. So you might ask, how do we then identify multiple reports? The most obvious indicators of multiple reports from the same study are the study title, authors, and their hospital affiliation. Most importantly, look at the hospital where patients were recruited or the database for which the patient data was extracted, as well as the study period. These two articles are clearly multiple reports from the same study. Thus, one of them has to be removed to prevent duplication of data. It is also important to note that multiple reports from the same study have to be scrutinized carefully. First, identify where the overlap is. Secondly, consider if the outcomes of interest overlap. For instance, two reports from the same study might report different study outcomes of interest and thus, both reports should be considered for inclusion. Thirdly, in cases where a duplicate report has to be removed, the report of lower quality or with smaller sample size is typically excluded. And this exclusion criteria has to be clearly stated in the manuscript. Finally, in cases of uncertainty, consider consulting senior authors, although this might be time and effort intensive. So this is an example of the Prisma flow diagram, which is a visual representation of the process following, followed in a systematic review or meta-analysis. It provides a clear overview of the study selection process and helps demonstrate the flow of studies from initial 
identification to the final inclusion in the analysis. A Prisma flow diagram should be presented for all systematic review and meta-analysis. So just to recap, we have examined the formulation of research questions using the PICO framework, how to design search, a search strategy, and how to do study selection. And now we'll move on to the subsequent stage, which is data collection. So data collection is gathering relevant information from the primary studies, and it's often needs to be done by two independent authors to ensure no bias is being done. So data collection involves gathering relevant information from the primary studies and is usually done by two, at least two independent authors. Each author independently extracts data from the primary study and cross-check the result to ensure accuracy and consistency. Additionally, spreadsheet software such as Excel or Google Sheet they are commonly used to consolidate the extraction data and to provide a structured format for organizing and analyzing the data. So moving on, data to be extracted from primary study can be categorized into four broad categories. Characteristics of the study, patient baseline characteristic, intervention details, and outcome data. So as you can see shown on the slide. So study characteristics include false author, years of, year for study, country where study was conducted. Baseline characteristics include details such as age, percentage of male participants or any comorbidities. Intervention details include the type of treatments and treatment regimes employed in the primary studies. Finally, specific outcome of interest in the meta-analysis. They are usually determined in advance and the nature of the outcome data should include continuous variable, categorical variables or effect size such as odd ratios or hazard ratios, depending on the research question. Following data collection, quality assessment using a risk of bias tool is performed to evaluate the methodological quality of the included study. Commonly used tools for randomized controlled trial includes the Cochrane risk of bias tool, while commonly used tools for non-randomized studies including the Robbins Eye, Newcastle Ottawa Scale, or the Joanna Briggs Institute. The aim of, of is to determine the level of confidence in the result of each study and to consider their potential impact on the overall findings of the meta-analysis. Risk of bias assessment focuses on the internal validity of the inclu in included studies. So how do we assess bias? So this is just an example of how we assess bias using the Cochrane ROB2. So bias can range from low to high or sometimes maybe unclear. So what we need to assess in uh, things like study design, sample size, data collection methods, and potential source of bias. It's, in, it's recommended to report the result of the bias appraisal in the final manuscript just to ensure the transparency and allow readers to understand the potential limitation and strength of the included study. Okay, so now looking at the example, you can see details regarding the domains that the particular ROB2 assesses and you can find it on the Cochrane website. Different tools often have very different evaluation criteria. And based on the study design, uh, one has to choose one of the two. And it's also very important to use validated risk of wire tools that have been widely employed and accepted in the research community, such as the, such as the one mentioned in uh, such as the ones mentioned in the previous slide. Okay. So we have seen how we can assess the risk of bias, but turning to the other side, addressing bias is also very important in a meta-analysis. And I'm just going to be sharing with you a few key points related to it and ways to handle it. So one of the ways that we can address bias or compact the bias is through sensitivity analysis and subgroup analysis. So an example of sensitivity analysis is the leave one out analysis. So this is a technique which involves systematically removing one study at a time from the meta-analysis and reanalyzing the data without the study, observing the impact on the overall study. It helps identify studies that might have, have an excessive influence on the overall result and provides insight into the generalizability of the meta-analysis meta -analysis findings. Alternatively, Subgroup analysis into high versus low risk of bias study 
can provide insights into the robustness of the overall finding. In some cases, it might be appropriate to exclude study with high risk of bias from the meta-analysis. The decision should be made based on the specific circumstances and the research question, with careful consideration of the potential impact on the overall finding. Finally, clearly report the presence of any bias in the limitation section to provide transparency. Moving on, one of the other important source of bias in a meta-analysis is publication bias. Publication bias refers to the tendency for smaller studies or studies with non-significant results to be less likely to be published, leading to an imbalance in the available evidence. Note that the evaluation of publication bias is a distinct aspect from quality assessment using a risk of bias too. So you might ask how then we evaluate publication bias. So there are two methods. There are always subjective and objective methods to evaluate publication bias. So subjective methods such as the funnel plot symmetry involve visualize, visually examining the distribution of study results. A symmetrical funnel plot suggests the absence of publication bias, while asymmetry may indicate the presence of bias. However, subjective methods are comparative and rely on visual interpretation. Objective methods such as Agus regression for continuous outcomes and the Harbour test for binary outcomes provide quantitative assessment of publication bias. These tests analyze the relationship between study size and effect estimates, providing statistical evidence for publication bias. Both of these methods can be used to assess publication bias in a meta-analysis, and reporting the findings of publication bias in the final manuscript is recommended to provide a comprehensive interpretation of the meta-analysis result. So this is just an example of a final plot. So as we mentioned, it is a really useful tool to assess publication bias, and it can be generated on software such as Riefman. But it's important to note that final plot should only be used when there are at least 10 studies and are not applicable to single arm meta-analysis when there is no comparison group, such as a prevalence meta-analysis. And here we have shown two types of uh, results that you can see on funnel plot, a symmetrical and an asymmetrical. So an ideal funnel plot would be where the include study have scattered either side of the overall effect line in a symmetrical manner. So as you can see, the severe asymmetry to either side is an indication that publication bias may be present. And this should ideally be confirmed using quantitative tests such as Agis or Harbour. Although publication bias can affect the validity of a meta-analysis, it does not directly affect the overall findings obtained from the included study. Most importantly, it is crucial to transparently acknowledge and discuss the inherent biases in the meta-analysis, clearly stating the potential biases as limitations within the discussion se section provides transparency and allows the reader to interpret the results more accurately. Okay, now I'll be looking at the, one of the uh, another challenge that we, we might face in conducting meta-analysis, which is the presence of heterogeneity. So studying heterogeneity and statistical heterogeneity are two types of heterogeneity commonly encountered in meta-analysis. Study heterogeneity refers to variation in study characteristics across the included study in a meta-analysis. So this variation can arise from differences in study design population characteristics, interventions, outcome measures, or other relevant factors. Study heterogeneity should ideally be minimized during the refinement of the research question, question using PICO and during the study selection stage. In contrast, statistical heterogeneity, also known as between-study heterogeneity, reverse, refers to the variability in the effects estimates among the included studies in a meta in a meta-analysis, that is beyond what we would be expecting by chance. So a statistical heterogeneity is unfortunately unavoidable and it actually influences the choice of statistical models. And, it's, uh, and most of the time we, we measure it quantitatively using tests such as Cochrane's Q-test or the I2 statistic. Okay, so now I'll just be looking at Cochrane's Q-test. So for, for Cochrane Q-test, a test, p-value below 0 0.05 suggests 
the presence of heterogeneity among the included study. However, it is important to note that the tests may have low power when there are a small number of studies or small sample size, meaning that it may fail to detect heterogeneity even if it exists. Conversely, a non-significant p-value does not necessarily indicate the absence of heterogeneity. Similarly, i square test is often misinterpreted. It represents the percentage of total variation across studies that is due to heterogeneity rather than chance. It's important to consider the context and magnitude of the i square value. While there's no strict threshold for interpreting the i square value, the following, gen uh, the following general guidelines are often used. 0% uh, represent no heterogeneity, 25 to 50% represent low to moderate heterogeneity, 50 to 75% represent moderate to high heterogeneity, while any value greater than 75% represent high heterogeneity. Importantly, note that high i square value can often be observed in large sample size or single arm meta analysis, as they often inflate the heterogeneity estimate. As, so this is one of the pit, pitfalls of the i square test that should be kept in mind. In summary, while the Q test and i square test are useful tests to assess heterogeneity, the interpretation requires careful consideration. We highly recommend defaulting to the random effect model for all analysis, just to better account for the heterogeneity. And the presence of a heterogeneity should always be reported in the limitation section to ensure transparency and comprehensive reporting. Additionally, consider not performing meta-analysis and conducting a systematic review of the literature instead, where the heterogeneity in the outcomes can be better explored. Other, other strategy includes conducting subgroup analysis or meta-regression, or changing choice of effect measures. Finally, check for erroneous data and consider excluding low quality study. And most importantly, do take note while there are currently no appropriate tools to measure heterogeneity in single arm meta analysis, this should also be reported in the methodology section when appropriate. So this brings us to the end of the first section of the meta analysis course. So together we went through the main steps starting from research question forming to developing search strategy, followed by study selection and data collection. Then we talk about quality assessment and lastly, how to measure heterogeneity. In the next episode, we'll dive deeper into the statistical analysis, which comprise the most technical aspect of meta-analysis. So thank you for watching this video and see you in the next video. Thank you again. Hope you enjoyed the episode today, and Research Lab is here to help you to find the answers you need. We have a unique approach to research that emphasizes collaboration, creativity, and innovation. Our team is available to provide guidance and feedback throughout the process. If you are interested in learning more, contact us at Research Labs today using the link shown. Thank you.